Welcome to the first of five presentations on genetic testing and genetic technologies. In this series of presentations, we're going to be looking at how genetic testing and genetic technologies are used in the modern world. We're going to start by looking at diagnostic testing for genetic diseases, move on to recombinant DNA technology, genetically modified organisms, genomes and complex traits, and then finish up with a brief look at personalized genomics. Throughout this course, we're going to be using a couple of resources. The first is Campbell's Biology, a textbook for undergraduate students. If you don't have this, it doesn't matter. You're going to be told everything that you need uh, in this series of presentations. We're also going to have a number of uh, self-learning questions, uh, like this one here. When these come up, the, probably the best thing to do is to stop the talk and uh, see if you can answer it, and then move on again. We'll talk a little bit about what the, the answer is. These are a really good way of making sure that you have learned all the material that are presented up to the time of the questions are presented. So who am I? My name is Murray Cox and I'm a professor of computational biology at Massey University in New Zealand. Here in New Zealand there's a traditional Maori way of uh, introducing who you are. Um, ko Taranaki Nui Te Maunga, ko Te Hanui Te Awa, ko Pākehā Te Iwi. Ko na iwi o te whenua, te atiawa. Ko mari tōku ingoa, tēna koutou, tēna koutou, tēna koutou katoa. Welcome everyone to this series of courses, and I hope you enjoy it um, as much as I've enjoyed putting it together. For this particular presentation, we're going to have a number of learning objectives. So the first is to explain how PCR and PCR RIFLIP can be used in genetic disease diagnosis. If you don't know these terms, don't worry, you will do by the end of the presentation. The second learning objective is to interpret the results of PCR and PCR RIFLIP diagnostic tests. The third is to design a protocol for a diagnostic test, including control experiments and examples. And the fourth is to describe some examples of diagnostic testing applications. But before we start going into the detail, I just want to give you a bit of background. So let's start with this, this particular example. This is Huntington's disease. So what is Huntington's? It's a progressive brain disorder that causes uncontrolled movements, emotional problems, loss of thinking ability, and eventually death. And the disease usually appears in a person's 30s and 40s. So it's a, it's a very tragic, different uh, disorder. And the person who found the genetic basis of this was someone called Nancy Wexler. She developed the diagnostic test, but all without knowing whether she was at risk herself. So um, her mother happened to have this disease, and when she was doing all this genetic testing, Nancy Wexler didn't know whether she had it as well. So today, genetic tests like those developed by Nancy Wexler uh, are used all the time. So how do we develop them? apply them and interpret diagnostic genetic tests. And, as we'll see at the end of this particular presentation, what happened to Nancy Wexler? Let's start by talking a little bit about why you might want to do genetic testing. So there's a number of reasons. For instance, you might want to reliably diagnose and quickly target treatment for genetic diseases. That's particularly pertinent at the moment with the coronavirus outbreak. You might want to make rapid breeding decisions for agricultural stock. Another use is to monitor environmental changes. And there are many other uses, including things like paternity testing and forensics, tissue typing, food pathogen detection, and, and much, much more. Why do you want to use PCR-based tests? So remember that PCR is this method that takes a small amount of DNA and amplifies it up into very large amounts. The reason you might want to use this particular technique is to accommodate very small sample sizes and small amounts of DNA, which is very, very typical in most testing scenarios. It also means that you can do very rapid testing, and often you want to get an answer very, very quickly. And particularly it allows very, very fast transitions from the lab to the clinic, which is again very, very important during outbreaks. So diagnostics is now an $8 billion global market, it's a very, very important thing um, in, the, in the medical and, and other areas. So how do you begin to diagnose DNA size changes? DNA 
is often run on an agrose gel, and an example is shown here. So in this particular case, DNA from a single individual is run in each lane. So that's each of those vertical um, kind of lines you see there on, on the graph. The stained bands indicate the PCR products with different sizes. So the, the bands at the top are bigger than the bands at the bottom. And there are different size PCR products, which all represent different genetic alleles. If we take Huntington's as an example, so if we think about it, Huntington's is a dominantly inherited disorder caused by extra copies of a glutamine codon. So that's a CAG codon in the Huntington's disease gene in, in exon 1. So here what you see is that in the, in the top example, you've got the wild type allele, which has got 20 different copies of the CAG repeat. In the bottom example, you've got a disease-causing allele, where you've got 45 copies of the CAG repeat. And PCR can be used to distinguish these alleles based on length. So how can we use PCR to distinguish between these alleles? So here's the alleles again. On the top, you've got the wild type allele, with CAG repeated 20 times. On the bottom, you've got the disease-causing allele with CAG uh, repeated 45 times. And what you want to do is develop PCR primers that bind on each side of that CAG repeat region. So here we've got, for instance, the, the orange primer on the left and the mauve primer on the right. And what this will do, if you amplify up the region using PCR and then run it out on a gel, is that for the disease-causing allele, you will find a large band. And for the wild type allele, you will find a small band. So here's an example. Perhaps uh, in a moment, stop the video and, and think of what you think the answer might be. So consider the, the scenario. You've got a man who developed Huntington's disease at the age of 45. His family were tested to see whether his children inherited the disease. OK, so what we're showing on the right here is a picture of an agarose gel. On the top, we've got the mother, child one, two, and three, and then the father. And the DNA is going to move on this gel from top to bottom. So here's the banding pattern. The question is, have any of these children inherited the disease, and what else do these results suggest? You might want to stop uh, the presentation now and have a think about this. The first question is, have any of the children inherited the disease? And the answer is no, they haven't. So the father has a very large product, uh, a very large band, and that indicates he's got the disease-causing allele, that, that um, amplified CAG repeat. But no one else carries uh, that particular large uh, allele, so none of children 1, 2, and 3. What else, however, do these results suggest? And this is the key point. In this particular case, none of the children carry either of the bands from the father. So he's not actually the dad of these particular children, not the biological father. Let's look at a slightly different example. So lysosomal storage disorder. This is a metabolic disease uh, that leads to the buildup of toxic material in cells. Lesions occur in many cell types, including the corneas, so this is in the eyes, and you get this buildup of complex sulfated sugars that aren't broken down in the lysosomes. So what, so what this leads to is a situation like this. So this is a, a dog called Stanley, and if you look at his eyes, particularly his corneas, you can see that he, he's basically blind, and this is because of this buildup of these sugars in the cornea of the eyes. So this particular disorder is caused by a 22 base pair deletion in the aryl sulfatase B gene. Uh, the key point here is that it's 22 base pairs, and that's a special number. So um, codons always come in pairs of 3, and 22 is not a multiple of 3. So what you've got here is a frame shift. So in the normal individual, that's shown there, the sequence at the top. In the mutant, however, You've still got the same sequence in the beginning, then you've got this 22 base pair deletion, and then the amino acids change, and actually leads to a stop codon uh, very quickly down the track. PCR can again be used to distinguish these alleles based on length, as shown in this picture of a gel photo. So the normal allele is long, 
and the mutant allele is short. But what if your disorder has a, a, a mutation that doesn't actually give a size difference? Well, then we can use these things called restriction endonucleases. These are uh, important enzymes that are, they occur naturally. They're part of the bacterial defense system. And they cut at a specific symmetric sequence. So here, for instance, you're looking at an ECOR1 cut site, which cuts at the DNA sequence GAATTC. The purpose of this in, uh, in a normal natural environment is for bacteria to degrade the DNA of invading phages, so basically invading viruses. Um, but it doesn't cut the bacteria's own chromosome because the bases of the DNA in the bacteria are methylated. So this restriction endo endonuclease doesn't, um, doesn't cut them. So let's look at an example of a disorder where we might need to use restriction endonucleases. And this the example I want to give you is one of sickle cell anemia. This is a, a severe hereditary form of anemia um, where uh, mutated hemoglobin distorts red blood cells into a crescent shape at low oxygen levels. And so you basically can't get enough oxygen into your blood. It's very common amongst individuals with African ancestry. Um, and it's a major disorder. So here we're looking at a picture of a, a treatment um, in, in America. But of course, it's a much bigger problem in parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa where there isn't such good healthcare uh, available. And on the picture on the right, you're starting to see some of these sickle cells forming. So that's in the upper right-hand part of that picture, whereas blood cells are normally this kind of uh, flattened coin-type uh, coin shape. So what does this look like genetically? So we've got the wild type and sickle cell forms of the beta globin gene, and they each differ by a single base. So here we're looking at the wild type beta globin, and you've got um, the DNA sequence. We're looking at the bottom here, so it's a GAG, yeah, this particular codon. That turns into a GAG codon in the mRNA, and that creates uh, a normal a hemoglobin containing a glutamic acid. In the sickle cell beta globin uh, allele, though, it's, it's a little bit different. So here you've got, instead of a GAG, you've got a GTG, which, uh, remember, for, for DNA moving to, um, to RNA, thymine changes to uracil, so in the mRNA it's GUG, and then that encodes a, an amino acid called valine. Okay, so you've got a, a, a single protein here that has got a single amino acid change from glutamic acid to valine. Now, conveniently, the mutation that uh, causes this mutant beta globin uh, deletes a particular restriction enzyme site for the restriction enzyme DDE1. So in the wild type, what you have is this kind of pattern. You've got, at least in this part of the region of the genome, you've got four different DDE1 sites. So uh, that produces fragments of 175 base pairs, then 201 base pairs, and then a very, very large fragment. However, in the mutant form, that second DDE1 site is deleted. And so now if you were to run uh, the, the cut DNA on a gel, you would see a fragment of 376 base pairs and again that very large um, fragment just as before. This kind of mapping or testing is called restriction fragment length polymorphism, often called RIFLPs or RFLPs. And so here you can look at the individuals who happen to have um, sickle cell anemia, so they are indicated by bright red, they're homozygous, they carry two allelic copies of this particular allele, and they have a variant at 376 base pairs. For individuals who are wild type or heterozygous, they also have the wild type allele, which is two bands at 201 base pairs and 175 base pairs. Okay, time for another class discussion. So here's the same setup that we've just been looking at. The question is, what is the best pair of PCR primers, they're indicated by orange arrows, that we should use? 
1 and 4, 2 and 4, 3 and 4, or 2 and 3? Stop now uh, and have a think about what you think the correct answer is. So the answer is B. So prime is 2 and 4. So let's go through the other answers and see why they're, they're really not the best ones. So, uh, Option A was primers 1 and 4. Why is that not so good? Well, if you look at primer 1, it is on the other side of this, this first DDE1 cut side. So that's not ideal. That's why we don't really want that particular primer. Option C is primers 3 and 4. Well, that's not very useful because the diagnostic uh, cut site, so that DDE1 site, the second one there, uh, the, the bit of DNA you would amplify with primers 3 and 4 doesn't include that, that diagnostic cut set, so that's not useful. The final option, D, is uh, primers 2 and 3. And that's not going to work because both of those primers sit in the same direction. So what you really need with PCR primers are primers that sit in opposite directions. So the best uh, pair of primers for this particular example is primers 2 and 4 that sit on either side of the diagnostic DDE1 cut site and that um, face in opposite directions to each other. Here's another class discussion question. We've got a scenario here of a gel. Uh, you've got lanes 1, 2 and 3. And we know that we've got three samples. So one is wild type homozygote, so it's got both uh, copies are the wild type. You've got a heterozygote, so it's got one wild type copy and one sickle cell copy. And then you've got a sickle cell individual who's a homozygote. So they've got both of their copies of their uh, alleles are the sickle cell variant. But unfortunately, we've got here is a situation where the student has mixed up the samples. So what is the right order on the gel? Perhaps stop for a moment and see if you can figure it out. The correct answer is option C. So the order is heterozygote, wild type, and then sickle cell. So if you look in the first lane, uh, you've got four different, three different bands here. So two at the bottom are the wild type, the 201 and 175 base pair fragments. The one at the top is 376 base pairs. And so you know that that first uh, lane carries a heterozygote. So automatically that tells you that the answer has to be either B or C. It can't be A or D. Sample number two, or lane number two rather, carries the wild type allele, but that's all. So you've only got bands at 201 base pairs and 175 base pairs. You do not have the mutant allele at 376 base pairs. So this means that that particular individual is homozygote wild type, which means, of course, that the answer has to be C. But then just for completeness, let's look at lane 3. There you've only got one band, the 376 base pair mutant allele. You don't have the wild type alleles, and so you, that particular individual has to be um, a homozygote for sickle cell anemia, the giving answer C. All right, one more class discussion. In this particular example, you have DNA from three individuals, just like we did before, and you need to make a test for sickle cell anemia. What is the correct order of procedures? So the procedures that you have available to you are, one, you can cut the DNA with DDE1, two, you can PCR amplify the DNA, and three, you can run the DNA on a gel. What is the correct order of procedures to take? Again, stop the video now and have a bit of think what you think the answer might be. And the answer here is option C. So you PCR, you cut, and then you run. So let's go through uh, the first maybe couple of options. So the first options, A and B, the first thing you can do is you cut the DNA with a restriction enzyme. Why is that not going to work? Well, basically because if you cut the DNA first, then you cannot PCR amplify it afterwards. So if you cut the DNA into pieces, you need, um, for PCR, you need a, a single um, unbroken strand of DNA to amplify up. So if you cut it, then PCR isn't going to work. So that knocks out options A and B. 
D, what's wrong with that particular option? You PCR first, then you run it, then you cut it, then you do the PCR. The answer, of course, is that you only need to do the PCR amplification once. Uh, you don't need to do it twice. So your best option is to take your, your DNA from your individual to PCR it up, then to cut it with the restriction enzyme, and then to run it on a gel. All right, let's look at another example just to see if we can get some of these ideas a bit, a bit better embedded. So this example is chondrodysplasia which is a malformation of the cartilage, and it impairs normal development of many parts of the body. And what it um, manifests as in this particular case in, in sheep is dwarfism. So you often have this sort of barrel-shaped chest, um, a wide base stance, um, so the legs are quite a long way apart, a shorter neck, and various forelimb deformities. And so if you look at the picture on the right, you can see deformed cartilage of the trachea, so the windpipe. So they've got the normal windpipe on the, on the left, and that's kind of nice and round, and it's heavily deformed in the right. So this particular disorder is caused by a single nucleotide deletion. Okay, so one base pair deletion of a, of a thymine in exon 3 of the sodium sulfate transport gene. And this leads to a frame shift, again, because a single base pair, um, it, it damages that whole three base pair triplet um, coding. And it also leads to a stop codon pretty quickly down the track, which is often uh, a trend of, of frame shift deletions. So here's a class discussion. You've got the single base pair deletion that we've just been looking at. Now this happens to create a new recognition site for the restriction enzyme HPYAV. So in the top here in green, you've got the wild type allele that contains the wild type sequence, so it contains that thymine. And if you amplify up this particular region, you end up with a 349 base pair region because it doesn't have the cut site. In red, you're shown the mutant version. So this has got the deletion of the T. If you cut this with HPYAV, then you get two fragments, 192 base pair fragment and 156 base pair fragment. PCR RIFLIP can distinguish these alleles. So in other words, you can PCR the DNA, then cut with HPYAV. So here's a, a gel photo, but without the bands shown. What do you think the expected pattern of DNA fragments on the gel should be after you've done the PCR and the RFLP RIFLIP analysis? Stop here, have a think, and then see what the answer is. And this is the expected pattern. So on the left, we've got wild type, so wild type homozygous. And so that's going to carry only that wild type band at 349. And remember that big bands are at the top and little bands are at the bottom. If we go right to the right hand of the, of the gel photo, you can see the mutant. Uh, this is a mutant homozygous. And again, for both of their copies of the DNA, you're going to have a cut site uh, formed for HPYAV. And so you're going to see two bands, the 192 base pairs and 156 base pairs. And then in the middle, you've got the carrier. Okay, so the heterozygote or the carrier, so one who's got one copy of each. So he's got up the top the wild type band and down the bottom the two mutant bands. Let's look at, at another example. This is an inherited rickets. So this is a, a softening and weakening of the bones. It's usually called by prolonged vitamin D deficiency, but in some cases, like the one we're going to look at here, it's also genetic and it tends to occur mostly in children. Again, this can carry out in sheep. So uh, Corridale lambs are a particular breed of, of sheep that's used in New Zealand, and 180 Corridale lambs in New Zealand have inherited rickets, which is shown in this particular photo. So the, the sheep on the left is wild type, they're perfectly normal. The one on the right has this inherited form of rickets. A genetic maker has been used to um, help breeders avoid adverse matings, and the testing is done at Massey University. Um, and this has also turned out to be quite a good model for inherited rickets in humans. 
So here's another class discussion. You've got uh, this particular disorder, the, this inherited rickets, is caused by a nonsense mutation. Okay, so CGA goes to TGA, causing a stop codon, okay, so a nonsense mutation, in dentine matrix protein 1. This leads to a truncated protein and a new NLA3 recognition site. So here we've got a picture. So at the top, we've got the wild type, where there is um, there's always going to be one cut site, but the second cut site is not present. So you, in this particular case, for the wild type, you've got 134 base pair band and a 500 base pair band. The bottom example shows the mutant DNA. And this one contains two cut sites for NLA3. Okay, so again, you've got that 134 base pair band, but now, instead of the 500 base pair band, you've got a 202 base pair and a 298 base pair band. Okay. So here's an example of a gel. And uh, you've got four different lanes there, and they're labeled M, A, C, and N. The question is, what do the labels mean? Stop here, have a think what your answer might be, and then start the video again. So in this particular case, the M stands for a size marker. It's often called a, a size ladder as well, right? So those are bits of DNA with no incisors so that you can interpret what the bands are in the other lanes. The A stands for affected, in this particular case, a homozygous mutant. The C stands for carrier, so a heterozygous individual. And the N stands for normal, a homozygous wild-type individual. So we started off this presentation by talking about Nancy Wexler, who developed this test for Huntington's disease by looking at uh, the genetics of an extended family whose pedigree is shown up on the wall in this particular photo. Nancy's mother had the disorder, and so the question that Nancy had when she was doing this test is, did she have it too? And what was the answer to that? The short answer is that she did not have the disorder. So this is Nancy Wexler today. She's currently Higgins Professor of Neuropsychology at Columbia University, and a major uh, and important figure in the field of genetics. So in our next presentation, we're going to be looking at recombinant DNA technology. Before that presentation, if you have the textbook, you should read up about restriction enzymes in Campbell, page 404, and about plasmids and gene cloning on pages 418 to 422. If you don't, you can look at those online and see what material you can find there, or otherwise you'll get to hear about them in the next presentation uh, coming up soon.